What is socialism for the 21st century? Often the best way to, to begin to understand something is to consider what it is not. Socialism for the 21st century is not a society in which people sell their ability to work and are directed from above by others whose goal is profits rather than the satisfaction of needs. It is not a society where the owners of the means of production benefit by dividing workers and communities in order to drive down wages and intensify work, in other words, gain by increasing exploitation. Socialism for the 21st century, in short, is not capitalism. Nor is it a statist society where decisions are top-down and where all initiative is the property of state office holders or cadres of self-reproducing vanguards. Socialism for the 21st century rejects a state which stands over and above society and squeezes, in Marx's words, quote, the living civil society like a boa constrictor, close quote. Also, socialism for the 21st century is not populism a society in which people look to the state to provide them with resources and with the answers to all their problems, leaves them as people who look to the state for all answers and to leaders who promise everything. Further, socialism for the 21st century is not totalitarianism. Neither state nor community pressures for uniformity in productive activity, consumption choices, or lifestyles support the emergence of what Marx welcomed as unity based upon recognition of difference. In particular, socialism for the 21st century does not dictate personal belief through, for example, a state religion or state atheism. Nor does socialism for the 21st century worship technology and productive forces, a fetish that took the form in the Soviet Union of immense factories, mines, and collective farms to capture presumed economies of scale and in the process destroyed the earth, our common home. Finally, contrary to its self-proclaimed inventor, Heinz Dietrich, socialism for the 21st century is not essentially a problem of informatic complexity which requires cybernetic calculation of quantities of concrete labor as the basis for exchange of equivalents. So let us explain what socialism for the 21st century is. There are lessons to be learned from the experience of the 20th century. And the Bolivarian Constitution of Venezuela, adopted in 1999, reflects many of those lessons. In Article 299's emphasis upon ensuring overall human development, in the declaration of Article 20 that everyone has the right to the free development of his or her, her own personality, in the focus of Article 102 upon developing the creative potential of every human being and the full exercise of his or her personality in a democratic society, in Article 62's declaration that participation by people is the, quote, necessary way of achieving the involvement to ensure their complete development, both individual and collective, close quote. In the identification of democratic planning and participatory budgeting at all levels of society, and the focus in Article 70 upon self-management, co-management, cooperatives in all forms as examples of forms of association guided by the values of mutual cooperation and solidarity, and in the obligations noted in Article 135, which by virtue of solidarity, social responsible, responsibility, and humanitarian assistance are incumbent upon private individuals according to their abilities, the elements of socialism for the 21st century are present. We understand this concept of socialism more deeply. In order to understand it more deeply, we need to retrieve Marx's focus upon human development. In his 1844 manuscripts, Marx introduced the concept of a rich human being, a person who has developed his capacities and capabilities to the point where he is able to, quote, take gratification in a many-sided way, and, and, end of quote, and, quote, in whom his own realization exists as an inner necessity, as need, close quote. And Marx continued, in place of the wealth and poverty of, of political economy come the rich human being and rich human need. Real wealth, in short, is not material possessions, but the development of human capacity. What is wealth, Marx asked in the Grundriss, other than the universality of individual needs, capacities, pleasures, productive forces, etc.? Accordingly, he stressed the importance of what he called, quote, the development of the rich individuality, which is as all-sided in its production as in its consumption. 
That was Marx's conception of socialism, the creation of a society which removes all obstacles to the full development of human beings. And he maintained this position in capital, his late work, in contrast to the society in which the worker exists to satisfy the need of capital for its growth, Marx explicitly there evoked what he called, quote, the inverse situation in which objective wealth is there to satisfy the worker's own need for development, close quote. So consider what the worker's need for development implies. In that inverse situation, each individual is able to develop his own potential, in other words, quote, the absolute working out of his creative potentialities, close quote. The complete working out of the human content, the development of all human powers as such an end in itself. These are the productive forces of people, these are all quotations, incidentally, which have increased, quote, with the all-round development of the individual and all the springs of cooperative wealth flow more abundantly, close quote. Rich human beings are the premise and the result of this inverse situation in which wealth, material wealth is used to satisfy the worker's own need for development. The question though is, how are rich human beings produced? How do we ensure that everyone has the opportunity for the full development of her potential? It's not by giving people gifts from above. Marx was very clear on this. In his thesis on Feuerbach, he insisted, you don't change people by changing circumstances for them. For example, creating new structures, new communities and the like, and inserting people into them. On the contrary, Marx argued, it is really existing human beings who change circumstances, and they change themselves in that process. This was what he called revolutionary practice quote, the simultaneous changing of circumstances and human activity or self-change, close quote. And as in the case of the goal of rich human beings, the central concept of human development through practice was already present in Marx's 1844 manuscripts. Commenting on Hegel's focus on activity, an activity which occurred only in an ideal form, Marx repeatedly emphasized human activity as the way in which real concrete human beings produce themselves, and he explicitly in the 1844 manuscripts described, quote, real man as the outcome of man's own labor, close quote. This concept of the simultaneous changing of circumstances and self-change runs like a red thread through Marx's work. For example, in the very act of producing, Marx argued in the Grundriss, quote, the producers change too, in that they bring out new qualities in themselves, develop themselves in production, transform themselves, develop new powers and new ideas, new modes of intercourse and new needs and new language, close quote. The link connecting revolutionary practice and human development is obvious too in the struggles of workers against capital, which transform what Marx called circumstances and men and make workers fit to create a new world. Thus Engels stressed that through such struggles, the worker, quote, is no longer the same as he was before. And the whole working class, after passing through it, is a hundred times stronger, more enlightened, and better organized than it was at the outset, close quote. Similarly, Marx argued that struggles over wages prevent workers, quote, from becoming apathetic, thoughtless, more or less well-fed instruments of production, close quote. Indeed, without such struggles, Marx argued, wor workers would be a, quote, heartbroken, a weak-minded, a worn-out, unresisting mass, close quote. What we do, in short, forms us. This is the point of Marx's key link of human development and practice. We can remain dominated by the old ideas and can continue to be shaped by the inherited culture, or we can construct ourselves as new people through our protagonism. Human development and practice, as the Bolivarian Constitution recognized, cannot be separated. The protagonism of people is necessary, quote, to ensure their complete development, both individual and collective, close quote. And once we grasp Marx's key link, we understand that every human activity has two products, both the change in circumstances and the change in self both the change in the object of labor and the change in the laborer herself. 
In addition to the material product of activity, there is always a second product, the human product. Unfortunately, this second product is often forgotten. Accordingly, we need to ask a question that is rarely asked, what are the changes in the worker? What kinds of people are produced in the workplace? And the answer is, it depends. It depends on the nature of relations within the process of production. The second product, under the appropriate conditions, can be positive. But as Marx understood when discussing the failure of workers to struggle, the second product also can be negative. Consider what occurs under capitalist relations of production. Within the capitalist workplace, and here are lots of quotes, people are subjected to the powerful will of a being outside them who subjects their activity to his purpose. And this subordination to capital cripples and deforms workers. In Capital, Marx described the mutilation, the impoverishment, the crippling of body and mind of the worker bound hand and foot for life to a single specialized operation, which occurs in the division of labor characteristic of the capitalist process of manufacturing. But did the development of machinery rescue workers from this fate? And Marx said, no, it completes the separation of the intellectual faculties of the production process from manual labor. It completes, in short, the crippling of body and mind. And in this situation, Marx explained, head and hand become separate and hostile, and quote, every atom of freedom, both in bodily and intellectual activity, end of quote, is lost. Quote, all means for the development of production undergo a dialectical inversion, Marx accordingly indicated. They distort the worker into a fragment of a man. They degrade him and alienate from him the intellectual potentialities of the labor process. Again, quote. Rather than producing the all-round development of human beings, in short, capital deforms the worker and turns him into a fragment. Rather than producing a rich human being in capitalist production, there is the complete emptying out and the total alienation of the worker. The second product of capitalist production is the fragmented, crippled human being whose enjoyment consists in possessing and consuming things, the impoverished human being. Capitalism, Marx stressed, inverts everything. Characteristic of capitalist relations of production, he said, is that it is not the worker who makes use of means of production, but the means of production that make use of the worker. And referring to this same inversion at another point, he said, quote, it is not the worker who employs the conditions of his work, but rather the reverse, the conditions of work employ the worker, close quote. Thus subjects become objects, means become ends, in this, quote, inversion, indeed this distortion, which is peculiar to and characteristic of capitalist production, of the relation between dead labor and living labor, between value and the force that creates value, quote. Within the capitalist system, Marx concluded, quote, all means for the development of production undergo a dialectical inversion so that they become means of domination and exploitation of the producers, close quote. All of this is from Marx's capital. In contrast, Marx envisioned the inverse situation in which the means of develop for development of production are not means of domination and exploitation. To build a society oriented to the worker's own need for development, we must invert the capitalist inversion. In doing so, we must end this distortion which is peculiar to and characteristic of capitalist production. In doing so, we end the crippling and fragmentation of the producers and create the conditions in which producers are able to develop their capabilities, the conditions in which the second product of productive activity is a rich human being. So for Marx, it was absolutely essential to invert the capitalist division of labor, that dialectical inversion that cripples the body and mind of the worker and alienates from her the intellectual potentialities of the labor process. In the inverse situation, Producers in full self-awareness plan together and end the separation of thinking and doing. There is no doubt, Marx indicated in Capital, that, quote, those revolutionary ferments whose goal is the abolition of the old division of labor stand in diametrical contradiction with the capitalist form of production, close quote. In ending what Marx called this enslaving 
subordination of the individual to the division of labor, and therewith the antithesis between mental and physical labor, the second product can become not a distorted fragment of a man, but a rich human being. Ending that separation of thinking and doing is why Marx stressed the importance of the introduction of education into the workplace. This was a method, he said, quote, not only of adding to the efficiency of production, but as the only method of producing fully developed human beings, end of quote. Every day in which thinking and doing are separated is a day in which the second product is a fragmented and crippled human being. And that points to the necessity for worker decision making, which breaks down the division between head and hand. In its absence, the division between those who think and those who do continues, as does the pattern that Marx described as one in which, quote, the development of the human capacities on the one side is based on the restriction of the development on the other side, close quote. The recognition of the, in the Bolivarian constitution that the protagonist of people is absolutely the necessary way for their complete development identifies an essential element of socialism for the 21st century. Clearly, the activity through which pe people develop their capacity, though, is not limited to the sphere of production as narrowly defined within capitalism. We produce ourselves through all our activities, not only in recognized workplaces, but in homes and communities. Thus, every activity with the goal of providing inputs into development of human beings, especially those which nurture human development directly, needs to be understood as an aspect of production. Further, the conceptions that guide production must themselves be produced. Only through a process in which people are developed in making the decisions which affect them at every relevant level, in other words, their neighborhoods, communities, and societies as a whole, can the goals which guide productive activity be the goals of people. Well, let me you know, skip over a bit to talk about how it's not simply an issue of the you know, process of producing collectively uh, and developing one's own self through the process. It also requires the question of the social ownership of the means of production and also the orientation to production for uh, social needs, all of which was summed up in Chavez's concept of what he called the elementary triangle of socialism, um, of social ownership of the means of production, social production organized by workers for the purpose of social needs. And those three sides of the socialist triangle mutually interact to form a structure in which all these sides, all these elements simultaneously exist and support each other. But that very interdependence of the three sides social ownership, social production, social for social needs, means that the realization of each element depends on the existence of the other two. Without production for social needs, no real social property. Without social property, no worker decision-making oriented toward society's needs. Without worker decision-making, no transformation of people and their needs. All three sides are needed because the absence of any one side infects the whole. In this particular case, so it, this whole system, the system which allows for the full development of human beings, requires, you know, uh, the, reproduces itself only through institutions and practices through which people develop their capacities on all three fronts. And in this particular case, those institutions are workers' councils and neighborhood councils, and the means for integrating them horizontally and vertically. Those institutions are essential to ensure a process of production for communal needs and communal purposes in which protagonism within the workplace and community ensures that this is social production organized by the producers. And they constitute a state, these institutions, a particular kind of state, a state from below, a state of the commune type. Such a state, which Marx described as the self-government of the producers, is central to the concept of socialism for the 21st century, which was a point that Chavez grasped in describing the Venezuelan communal councils as the cells of a new socialist state. And this new state does not wither away, rather it is an integral part of socialism as an organic system. But an organic system doesn't drop from the sky. A new system never produces its own premises at the outset. Rather, a new system, when it emerges, necessarily inherits 
premises from the old. Its presuppositions, its premises, are historic ones produced outside the system. In other words, that system does not develop initially upon its own foundations. Therefore, every new system as it emerges is inevitably defective. It is, quote, in every respect, economically, morally, and intellectually, still stamped with the birthmarks of the old society, end of quote. Accordingly, as Marx indicated, the development of an organic system, quote, consists precisely in subordinating all elements of society to itself, or in creating out of the organs which, it, or in creating out of it the organs which it still lacks. This, historically, is how it becomes a totality, end of quote. So because of the particular defects it inherits from the old society, socialism must proceed to subordinate those elements if it is to produce itself its own conditions of existence. But to assemble the elements of a new society, although all societies will have different paths based on their own historical conditions, but to assemble the elements of the new society, one step in every particular path is critical, control and transformation of the state. To end the state of capital, the rule of capital, it is necessary to take the state away from capital. In other words, to end capital's ability to use the police, the judiciary, the army, the legislative bodies, and its other oppressive mechanisms to enforce its rule. Without the rule, the removal of state power from capitalist control, every real threat to capital will be destroyed. In the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels argued that, quote, the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of ruling class, to win the battle of democracy, and that workers would then use their political supremacy to wrest by degrees all capital from the bourgeoisie. The 20th century demonstrated, however, that political supremacy of the working class is not achieved simply by winning elections or seizing the state. The real battle of democracy is the creation of institutions that provide the space where members of society can develop their capacities through their protagonism. Of course, that can't happen overnight, and indeed might be quite lengthy, but Marx understood that it was necessary to, we, to begin to remove the defects inherited from the old society immediately. He made this point clearly in his critique of the Gotha program, and this point is one that I've not seen developed anywhere else, but you can see it in the book, The, Thir the Socialist Imperative. He said in that book, in the critique of the Gotha program, he said, we, we move immediately by introducing, and he made this point by introducing the matter of two specific deductions from the total social product before it is distributed to individual producers for consumer goods. Consider the first deduction that he identified, which is the general cost of administration not belonging to production, which is to say the costs associated with state administration. Marx was unequivocal in indicating that, quote, this part will from the outset be very considerably restricted in comparison with present day society, and it diminishes in proportion as the new, new society develops, close quote. But why is, this, why is there this immediate reduction in state administrative costs? And why is this the measure of the development of the new society? Marx's argument there must be put in the context of what he developed, learned a few years earlier from the Paris Commune. Those costs, quote, are very considerably restricted because the state, he explained, immediately ceases to be a public force organized for social enslavement. And that was what he argued the, the working class in motion discovered during the Commune. From the outset, state functions are wrested from an authority usurping preeminence over society itself and restored to the responsible agents of society. And the success of that struggle, Marx indicated, would have meant that in place of the old centralized government, quote, all France would have been organized into self-working and self-governing communes. That's a quote. Indeed, the result would be, quote, state functions reduced to a few functions for general natural purposes, close quote. As the new society develops in short, the state would be converted more and more, in the words of the critique of the Gotha program, quote, from an organ superimposed upon society into one, into one completely subordinate to it, 
close quote. And that old state, that old state with what he called its systematic and hierarchical division of labor, in which state administration and governing are treated as, quote, mysteries, transcendent functions only to be trusted to the hands of a trained caste, state parasites, richly paid sycophants, and sinecurists. From the outset, Marx said, that is complete, completely restricted. And the new society cre proceeds to create the new organs which it lacks, those self-working and self-governing communes in proportion as it develops. The experience of the commune, Marx declared, revealed the political form at last discovered under which to work out the economical emancipation of labor. So in describing the first of these deductions, both from the outset and as the new society develops, the critique of the Gotha program reflected what Marx learned from the Paris Commune. The second deduction points to the transformation in the distribution of the total social product in the new society. Secondly, Marx argued, there is, quote, that which is intended for the common satisfaction of needs, such as schools, health services, etc. In end of quote. In contrast to the last deduction, Marx indicated, quote, from the outset, this part grows considerably in comparison with present day society, and it grows in proportion as the new society develops, close quote. Compared to the existing society, more and more of the total social product immediately is devoted to expanding considerably the provision of use values for the common satisfaction of needs. More and more of its output is deducted from the private claims of individuals. However, Marx noted, quote, what the producer is deprived of in his capacity as a private individual benefits him directly or indirectly in his capacity as a member of society, end of quote. In place, then, of distribution in accordance with contribution, a concept of right inherited from the old society, as the new society develops, a new relation of distribution emerges in which our claim upon the output of society increasingly is as a member of society. The measure of the development of the new society is the expansion of the commons. This emerging distribution, relation of distribution, however, cannot rest in midair. The concept of a just distribution cannot be imposed upon the producers. Right, Marx indicated in the critique, can never be higher than the economic structure of society and its cultural development condition thereby. Accordingly, to introduce new relations of distribution requires new relations of production. In place of the relation as individual owners of the personal condition of production of labor power, owners who demand an equivalent for their individual activity, a new relation in which people, producers function consciously as, a mem as members of a community and emerges, and their cultural development, quote, is conditioned thereby. That is the condition for the new distribution. So in other words, what must happen in, if, if there is to be this new form of distribution is that the associated producers must create new organs that ensure conscious cooperation of activities determined by communal needs and purposes. Uh, a communal production, Marx indicated in the Grundriss, is presupposed, communality is presupposed as the basis of distribution, and this new relation of production determines the relation of distribution. Quote, its presupposed communal character would determine the distribution of products. The communal character of production would make the product into a communal general product from the outset, end of quote. In other words, the relation of distribution is not changed by exhortation. Rather, it changes as the new society develops producers directly in a conscious process of planning as determined by communal needs and purposes. So that's how the new society develops on its own foundation, how it proceeds to introduce, produce its own premises. It increasingly subordinates elements inherited from the old society and creates new organs for cooperatively planning the distribution of society's labor in order to satisfy the worker's own need for development. It does so by increasingly substituting for the old state, which stands over and above society, a new state based upon democratic institutions completely subordinate to society. In other words, those self-working and self-governing communes through which people are able to develop their potential. 
From the outset, in other words, the changes that Marx is in identifying, the process by which the defects inherited from the old society are transcended by the creation of new relations among the producers. From the outset and in proportion as the new society develops, every step must build the capacities of the working class. So why then, or though, do we speak of socialism for the 21st century and not simply socialism? Very simply because there was a rupture. Marxist critical emphasis upon human development disappeared in 20th century socialist experiments. Missing was a focus upon the key link of human development and practice, upon the simultaneous changing of circumstances and self-change. And with the failure to think specifically about the second product, positive or negative, the question of the nature of people produced under particular relations of production disappeared. One departure from Marx's perspective in the 20th century was the interpretation of socialism not as a process, but as a separate stage with specific characteristics that distinguish it from communism. A second departure was through the development of real socialism, a self-designation introduced to distinguish concrete 20th century experiences from merely theoretical conceptions of socialism. These two 20th century departures shaped the popular meaning of socialism and interacted to support each other. Marx's focus on socialism as a process directs attention, as we have seen, to co consideration of the elements of the old society that must be subordinated. The idea of socialism as a specific stage, however, emerged in the course of the Bolshevik struggle for power and led to a quite different emphasis, one which stressed the centrality of the development of productive forces. In the context of charges that the Bolsheviks were unrealistic utopians in 1917, Lenin interpreted the distinction that Marx made in his critique of the Gotha program between communist society as it initially emerges, its lower phase, and the higher phase once it rests upon its own foundations as indicating the difference between a stage of socialism and an ultimate stage of communism, an ultimate stage possible, quote, quote, only after an enormous development of productive forces, close quote. Marx's distinction between two moments in the process in which a new society advances by producing its own premises accordingly hardened into a difference between two systems, socialism and communism, each with its own strikingly different relation of distribution. What, you know, the 20th century formula emphasized the whole question of self uh, people getting in accordance with its contribution. It built upon the defect inherited from the old society, a focus on self-interest of owners. The 20th century formula then was to accept and build upon this self-orientation by insisting upon a so-called socialist principle of distribution to individuals on the basis of their contribution. And an argument was, well, if individuals in this stage are inherently self-oriented, then according to this logic, the most important thing is to ensure they are provided the necessary economic incentive to induce them to work well. No matter that Marx stressed in the critique of the Gotha program that from the outset in the new, as the new society developed, that a different distribution produced principle would increasingly prevail. No matter that he rejected the focus upon the right of distribution as an equivalent for one's activity as a right of inequality, and as a one-sided view of producers treating them, quote, only as workers and nothing more is seen in them, everything else being ignored, close quote. No matter that he declared that it is a mistake to make a fuss about so-called distribution and put the principal stress on it, uh, end of quote, as opposed to focusing on the mode of production, all that the 20th century interpreters took from Marx's critique of the Gotha program was their conclusion that distribution in accordance with contribution is necessary in the socialist stage. But how does this so-called socialist principle go beyond the economic, moral, and intellectual birthmarks of the old society? Is it possible to produce, proceed along a socialist path without changing economic relations among the producers? The 20th century answer was development of the productive forces in the socialist stage, supported by material incentives, creates the conditions for abundance. In that system, 
of communism as a system of abundance, the labor of people will become, quote, so productive that they will voluntarily work according to their ability and that this abundance would allow people to take freely according to his needs. New people, in short, in this interpretation, emerge as a trickle-down effect of the development of productive forces. One would search in vain, however, for any suggestion from Marx that it's possible to get to a future stage of abundance by trying to build upon a defect inherited from capitalism. Indeed, the second product characteristic of producing under these conditions points in precisely the opposite direction. Could you know, alienated labor to produce alienated product, alien products, alienation from other members of society, and alienation from socially owned material conditions of production, and thus could abundance ever be reached under these circumstances? Would, you know, if alienated labor leads to constantly growing needs to produce alien products, can there ever be an end to scarcity? Lost in genuflection to the so-called socialist principle is un any understanding of how the particular relations of production in the so-called socialist stage may produce cultural development and consciousness compatible with the re restoration of capitalism. As Che Guevara emphasized and warned in his Man and Socialism in Cuba, reliance upon material self-interest is a dead end. Quote, the pipe dream that socialism can be achieved with the help of the dull instruments left to us by capitalism, the commodity as the economic cell, individual material interests as the lever, etc., can lead into a blind alley. And you wind up there after having traveled a long distance with many crossroads, and it's hard to figure out just where you took the wrong turn. End of quote. Indeed, once you rely upon individual material interest, the solution to every problem is very clear. Give more material interest, increase material interest. And that was the point made by Gorbachev, saying the source of problems of the Soviet Union was, quote, serious infractions of the socialist principle of distribution according to a work, end of quote. The point is simple. If you try to create the new society by building upon its defects, what it has inherited from the old society, rather than building the new society, you are strengthening the elements of the old society. Understanding the theoretical departure from the concept Marx's concept of socialism is important, especially for those who seek to understand the alteration in the Marxist lit legacy. Far more important, though, in shaping the view of socialism has been the experience of concrete socialist experiments in the 20th century. Um, the concept of real socialism emerged in the 1970s in, the in Soviet Union and Eastern Europe for the principal purpose of distinguishing the existing system from theoretical abstract and abstract conceptions of socialism. Real socialism thus refers to the Soviet Union and countries which accepted with variations the Soviet model. Now that model appeared attractive, especially in poor countries, because the Soviet Union succeeded in combining its large rural population with state-directed investments to build an industrial base and achieve substantial increases in the standard of living. However, by and all in the context of external hostility. However, by the early 1960s, the deficiency of that model became increasingly apparent, so much so that Che, in the early 60s, predicted the restoration of capitalism in the Soviet Union. Certainly, the Soviet model explicitly rejected capitalism. In particular, its inherent tendency to generate employment, unemployment, inequality, and insecurity. The characteristic of real socialism then was its emphasis upon full employment, its protection of workers from dismissal, the subsidization of necessities, protection from price increases, and the promise of future increases in the standard of living. These benefits for workers were part of a social contract in which workers in return acquiesced in the direction of the party and the state over society. You know, that social contract despite the benefits, were now, which are now a source of nostalgia in the countries which have restored capitalism, despite characteristic of that social contract precluded the development of rich human beings. Characteristic of the model of real socialism is the conviction of the party state 
that it, it and it alone knows how to build socialism, that it and it alone can see the whole picture, and that accordingly it and it alone must lead. The perspective is that of the orchestra conductor who believes that spontaneity, the absence of predetermined unity, produces disaster, and that without his direction there would be chaos, and accordingly the working class must be prevented from making mistakes. So in the workplace, it was not workers who decided. Rather, it was a will outside them that determined how and what to produce. Nor was there an end to the separation of thinking and doing and the subordination of the individual to the capitalist division of labor. Rather than developing the capacities of workers, real socialism produced a fragment of a man, one degraded and alienated from the intellectual potentialities of the labor process. Furthermore, protagonism within the workplace and society that might permit the simultaneous changing of circumstances and self-change were discouraged. Transmitting its decisions downward through official social organizations and marginalizing social activity outside these, the party state precluded the opportunity for the working class, in the words of Rosa Luxemburg, to make its own mistakes and learn in the dialectic of history. After all, why follow such an uncertain and indeterminate path when the party state can guide society correctly? Given the existence of juridical state ownership of the means of production, which was equated with socialist relations of production, the central task as set out in the official theory was to develop the productive forces and thereby ensure passage to the state of abundance in which distribution would be in accordance with need. Very simply, characteristic of real socialism was the premise that the circumstances of workers and workers themselves would be changed under the direction of the party state. And of course, this is precisely the point that Marx rejected in his thesis on Feuerbach. It's, and he said, you know, this doctrine is bound to divide society into two parts, one of which is superior to society, close quote. What was lost in real socialism? In an obvious reference to what was missing in the Soviet model, Che commented about Cuba in 1964. And speaking about Cuba, he said, quote, for the first time in the world, we have established a Marxist socialist system that is congruent or approximately congruent with one that puts man at the center, that speaks about the individual, that speaks about man and his importance as the essential factor in the revolution, close quote. Consider what happens when Marx's key link of human development and, pra um, and practice, that coincidence of the changing of circumstances and self-change, is forgotten. Missing from real socialism was protagonism of the working class. Protagonism in the workplace, protagonism in the community, protagonism through society. The result was predictable. Alienation in the workplace, low productivity, and the desire for alien products. The result was, quote, apathetic, thoughtless, more or less well-fed instruments of production, close quote. Real socialism did not merely fail to produce real rich human beings. Its second product was a working class with neither the will nor the strength to prevent the restoration of capitalism. That path is a dead end. President Chavez of Venezuela was determined not to follow that path and insisted upon a rupture with the model of real socialism. Explicitly rejecting the Soviet experience as state capitalism, Chavez declared in January 2005 that, quote, we have to reinvent socialism, end of quote. And in subsequent mon months, he called specifically for the invention of socialism of the, for the 21st century. Quote, we must reclaim socialism as a thesis, a project, and a path. But this must be a new type of socialism, a humanist one, which puts humans and not machines or the state ahead of everything." Close quote. At the core of the, his view of socialism for the 21st century was Chavez's stress on the key link of human development and practice. Quote, socialists have to be made, he explained on Allo Presidente in 2007. A, a revolution has to produce not only food, goods and services, it also has to produce, more importantly than all of these things, new human beings, new men, new women, close quote. And agreeing with Che's point about the necessity of simultaneously developing productive forces and socialist human beings, che, Chavez insisted that the only road was practice, quote, we have to practice socialism. That's one way of saying it, have to go about building it in practice, and this practice will create us, ourselves. It will change us. If not, we won't make it, 
close quote. And precisely because he understood the importance of revolutionary practice, Chavez stressed the development of the communal councils where people transform both circumstances and themselves, calling, as I noted, those councils the cells of a new socialist state. And it is why in his last reflection, when already seriously ill, Chavez stressed the absolute necessity of building the communes, communa o nada, without the communes we're dead. You know, uh, and he argued that capitalist workplaces with their built-in hierarchical social division of labor should be replaced by one that involves the full participation of the associated producers and an appropriate means of coordination, and then he continued, and thus radically different from the organization organization of both the capitalist economy and the post-capitalist variety, quote, presented deceivingly as planning, close quote. For Chavez, the road was protagonistic democracy, protagonistic democracy in the workplace and community as the practice which transforms people. However, it is essential to recognize that this is not a reinvention. Rather, socialism for the 21st century is a revolutionary restoration, the return to Marx's understanding of socialism. This renewed vision, as reflected in the elementary triangle of socialism, once again puts human development, the full development of human potential at its center. It insists, one, that everyone has the right to share in the social heritage of human beings, an equal right to the use and benefits of the product of the social brain and the social hand in order to develop his or her own full potential, social ownership. Two, everyone has the right to be able to develop his or her full potential and capacities through democracy, participation, and protagonism in the workplace and society, a process in which these subjects have a, of activity have the precondition of the health and education that permit them to make full use of this opportunity. In other words, social production. Three, everyone has the right to live in a society in which human beings and nature can be nurtured, a society in which we can develop our full potential in communities based upon cooperation and solidarity, social needs. In other words, and one should note, this vision, this renewed vision is desperately needed now because it can once again move people to struggle against capitalism and to, quote, reclaim socialism as a thesis, a project, and a path. Thank you.